I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Leonard Guarente. Dr. Guarente is a biology professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he's been running a lab for many years. His scientific work focuses on the molecular and cellular processes involved in aging, including the molecules and the genes and all of the, the cellular level stuff that's involved in natural aging, as well as ways that we can develop strategies to actually extend the lifespan by tapping into some of these biological mechanisms. Dr. Guarente is also interesting because he's the founder and chief scientist for a company called Elysium Health, which focuses on taking the discoveries that are happening in aging research and actually bringing them to the public, both in the form of creating new health supplements, which can address various aspects of cellular, immune, or cognitive aging, as well as technology products that actually help you learn about your own aging, the rate at which your body is actually aging. And we got into a bunch of different topics related to aging and how all of these different things work. We talked about a molecule called NAD and some of the sort of core biology, the metabolic biology involved in the aging process and how that changes across the lifespan. We talked about molecules like omega-3 fatty acids and resveratrol, the famous molecule associated with red wine, as well as other molecules like pterostilbene, which have enhanced bioavailability properties that might lend themselves to be better used in health supplement products. We talked about Elysium Health, the company that Dr. Guarante co-founded and how they use the scientific research discoveries from his lab and from other labs to actually engineer products, health supplements, that have ingredients that are most likely to address various aspects of aging, whether that's at the level of cells and metabolism or the immune system or the brain. So we got into all that stuff. We also talked about epigenetics, the idea that you can actually look at certain molecular signatures on the DNA to determine or calculate someone's biological age in comparison to their chronological age. So, so for example, I took a test that measures this through a product that Elysium Health Cells, and I learned that my biological age is actually 30, but my chronological age, the number of years I've been alive, is 34. So my rate of aging is a little bit slower, the rate of biological aging, than my actual number of calendar years would suggest. And so we talked about how some of this technology technology works and how some of these supplements are utilizing findings from the scientific literature to actually try and build products that people can use to enhance or extend their lifespan. So if you're interested in aging biology and some of the practical aspects of that, things out there that you can do to learn more about your own aging, what's going on in your own body, or supplements you might be able to take to address aging-related decline for yourself, this will be a really interesting episode, and I definitely learned a lot from speaking with Lenny. And as always, if you enjoy the content of this podcast and, and you're learning a lot from it, please do like, share, and subscribe. I appreciate five-star reviews on Apple or Spotify or other podcast directories that you may be using. You can subscribe to the video version of the podcast on YouTube or on Odyssey. And you can also sign up for my free weekly newsletter at mindandmatter.substack.com. You'll get a weekly update about the podcast as well as a bunch of other interesting research and other things that I'm looking at related to the topics I cover on the show show. You'll have access to my long-form science writing on Substack. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. And with that, here's my conversation with Leonard Morante. Dr. Leonard Garante, thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Can you start off by just telling everyone a little bit about who you are and what your scientific background is? I am a professor at MIT. I've been on the faculty there for a long time, 40 years or so. And uh, my background is in molecular biology, including biochemistry and genetics. I have uh, studied a uh, few different areas of research with my lab over the years. Initially, we worked in the area of cell biology, and we specialized in uh, the organism of uh, yeast, which are single cells and relatively easy to study, but uh, which teach us broad principles about biology. And we did that uh, for about uh, 
10 years or so. And at that point, I uh, got a little bit antsy to try something a little bit bolder. And um, we decided to uh, make a foray into research on aging. And this was a very uh, a kind of uh, checkered uh, uh, past uh, riddled area at the time. And um, the, uh, the balance was, uh, on the one hand, uh, it was an area of not, not extremely high repute. And on the other hand, uh, there was an opportunity that if you actually did uh, make significant progress, um, it was a pretty big deal because there was really not much known about it, except descriptive things, comparing old organisms with young organisms and seeing uh, what changes with aging. So that was essentially the approach that had been done uh, in the decades prior to uh, the early 1990s when we got involved in this. And so we uh, worked in this area for some time. Um, and uh, since my lab uh, was very experienced with yeast, uh, we made the decision, and it's, it seemed ridiculous to some people at the time, but we made the decision to begin our studies of aging by studying aging yeast cells. And that's what we did. And uh, pretty much the first uh, five or 10 years in studying aging, we were studying aging in yeast cells. And what we set out to, to try and uh, query was whether there were specific genes, and we expected a small number, uh, which somehow regulated the rate of aging in yeast cells. And we decided to approach that problem by uh, uh, working, uh, using an assay for aging in yeast that was not measured by a clock or a calendar. So it was not, you were not measuring time, but you were measuring <laughs> how many times cells divided. Because it was already known that yeast cells had a very uh, limited number of divisions, roughly 20 or so, uh, after which they stopped dividing. Hmm. And what we uh, then did was uh, watch yeast cells divide under the microscope and count the number of times they divided. And it was about 20 or so. And we wanted to identify variants, uh, which are otherwise in genetics known as mutants, which would uh, be changes in the DNA sequence in the genome of yeast, which would have the effect of allowing that variant or that mutant to divide more than 20 times. Okay, so that would uh, increase the lifespan, if you will, uh, of that cell. And that, that really took about five to seven years to get through this, to, to actually uh, uh, succeed in identifying uh, genes uh, that had this property. And that's, that's, and it was very tedious work in the beginning. Um, but an interesting gene came out that uh, we uh, really have been studying ever since. Uh, which is a gene called SIR2 in yeast. And in, uh, it turns out that this gene is found in pretty much uh, every uh, organism or species uh, out there. And that includes uh, uh, simple uh, uh, animals like worms or fruit flies and uh, mammals such as mice or humans. So we all have genes that have a similar uh, sequence and encode uh, uh, similar proteins to this yeast gene, which is called SIR2. And in nature, collectively, these proteins have come to be called sir 2 because of their uh, similarity to the yeast gene SIR2. And what does this gene encode? What is the resulting protein doing? Yeah, so the gene, uh, so th that was uh, 
what we're interested in. So what the genetics told us was that if you eliminated this gene from yeast cells, you made their lifespan shorter by about half. Whereas if you gave yeast cells an extra copy of this gene, so they made more of the protein than normal, they live longer than uh, the natural strain, which in biology is called the wild type strain. Um, so that really said that this uh, uh, protein had the ability to uh, uh, regulate the lifespan in yeast, which is this peculiar lifespan based on cell divisions. So we started uh, in the next period trying to figure out exactly what the SIR2 protein does. And we were studying two uh, proteins, one from yeast, which was the SIR2 protein, which we purified, and the closest uh, uh, homologous protein from humans, okay, which is a protein called SIRT1, okay? So these are both sirtuins. They're uh, similar to one another, but not identical. One comes from yeast. The other comes from humans. And uh, we purified the human protein as well. So we had these two proteins in a test tube. And... Um, we had some background information that uh, allowed us to focus on a process which is um, mediated by uh, sirtuins, which is called silencing in yeast. And silencing is a process which takes a region of a chromosome where genes can be expressed in this region. And silencing shuts that down so that the genes are not expressed. So it's a kind of uh, 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 process that results in a, a, a portion of a chromosome just being kind of wrapped up in an inactive state. So it doesn't do anything, okay? And it turns out that that uh, silencing is, is an aspect of something that has since then uh, become pretty prominent in biology called epigenetics. And so genetics, as uh, started by uh, Gregor Mendel in the 1850s, is based on mutations that change the DNA sequence of a gene and change the uh, amino acid sequence of the protein encoded by that gene, okay, to result in a change in something you can see in the organism. Okay, in Mendel's case, it was uh, peas and plants and flowers. Um, in uh, epigenetics, okay, uh, you also have a change that you can see in the organism, but it is not mediated by a change in the DNA sequence at all. It is something... Be, it's different from that, which is where the epi comes from. And, and what it turns out is that it's a process that takes the chromosome and just shuts it down. Okay. And it was known that uh, there are proteins that bind to the chromosome uh, that are called histones. And histones are uh, essentially uh, just wrap the DNA into a ordered structure across the genome such that uh, the histones form a ball of proteins. It's called a nucleosome and the DNA wraps around that. Okay. And it was a change in the histones that mediates this process called silencing this epigenetic process. Okay. And um, that change in the histones is known to be due to uh, a modification of the proteins, okay? And proteins uh, are strings of amino acids, okay? And uh, certain amino acids, and a good example is lysine, for example, can also be modified by a tag that can be put on or off, uh, taken off of the lysine. And that tag is a very simple uh, two-carbon uh, acetyl group that can be put on the lysine or taken off the lysine. So the lysine can be either acetylated, 
where the tag is on or deacetyl edit where the tag is off. Okay. Now it turns out that it, uh, when histones are acetylated, they tend to promote an open structure in the DNA. So the, 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 the structure of DNA uh, around the histones is elongated and the genes can be expressed normally. However, when uh, the uh, histones are deacetylated, the lysines are taken off, uh, sorry, the acetyls are taking, taken off of the lysines, okay, then that region, which is deacetylated, shuts down and forms a compact structure and renders uh, those genes inaccessible and they're not expressed. So that was known. Okay, so, so uh, a lot of people had, uh, before us, uh, tried to see if these sirtuin proteins had the ability to remove these tags from the lysine. So it would go from an, the, an open structure in the chromatin to a closed structure and from the active state to the silent state. Okay, so that would make it an enzyme that would deacetylate, pull off the acetyl groups from the lysine. So people uh, uh, tried to find this activity, deacetylation activity in SIR2 and failed. They couldn't do it. Okay. So uh, that's where we, we started and we also didn't see it. Um, but uh, we were uh, at the same time interested in whether sir uh, were uh, silencing in a way that was somehow tuned to the metabolism of the cells. So we were also interested in molecules that were involved in metabolism at the same time. Okay. So that brought us to the uh, really the last key point here, which is uh, a molecule in cells that's called NAD. Okay. And NAD uh, is an uh, acronym for the chemical uh, name, which is uh, uh, nicotinamide, <coughs> excuse me, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. So it's two nucleotides that are put together, and um, and we're we we were interested in studying uh, whether NAD might have anything to do with uh, this process, and what we found. Uh, to make a long story short, is that uh, SIR2 had no deacetylation activity by itself. But if we add it to the reaction in the test tube now, if we add it to the reaction NAD, okay, then it triggered the deacetylation of the protein. So that meant that it was an NAD-dependent deacetylase. And that's a very, very uh, long-winded answer to your question of um, what do these proteins, th these sirtuins actually do? What is their biochemical or enzymatic activity? They are NAD-dependent deacetylases. And that, has, uh, uh, that finding has a lot of uh, different implications. Hmm. So, so these sirtuins were discovered to be important for, for yeast lifespan in terms of how many times the cells divide. They've got something to do with regulating how wrapped up or unwrapped up DNA is and whether or not those genes can be expressed in a way that depends on this NAD molecule. When we think about the, the finding you described in yeast, that, that their lifespan in some sense is the number of times the cells divide rather than time per se, how is that, would you say that's generally true? Is the same kind of thing true in human beings that, that our cells kind of divide a certain number of times across a human lifespan or what's going on there? Well, I think that it, it may be true in, in uh, humans, but for different reasons. Okay. So mm -hmm. in, in humans, what seems to happen is, so we have different tissues, different organs in our bodies. And uh, some have cells that divide all the time, okay? The gut, skin, blood. Uh, others at the other extreme uh, have cells that divide not at all. For example, the brain. Um, and so for at least some organs, 
in the human body, cell division is not at play because it doesn't happen. So that cells don't wear themselves out by dividing, okay? But they still age, right? So um, this kind of process that happens in yeast certainly cannot apply across the board in humans, okay? So what about those organs that do have dividing cells in humans, like the gut or the skin or blood? Um, are they uh, experiencing the same process? And you know, the answer is we don't know for sure, but the speculation would be no, because what's thought to happen, uh, at least the, I would say one of the, the most prominent hypotheses for why uh, these uh, tissues like the gut also age and cells uh, stop dividing is because of what happens at the ends of human chromosomes, where the ends of all of our chromosomes uh, are capped by a structure that are called telomeres. And what happens in mammals, including humans, is that uh, uh, as cells divide, the telomeres get shorter and shorter every cell division, okay? Until eventually they become critically short, okay? And the cell senses that uh, as um, uh, essentially it looks like a, a break in the DNA to the cells, the end of the chromosome, because it has just this little stub now, okay? And the cell gets a signal, uh-oh, the DNA is in bad shape, I can't divide anymore, okay? And that's probably the most likely reason that uh, for uh, organs with dividing cells, uh, cells stop dividing. And so it, it, are, are those things reversible or, or does it move only in one direction? Yeah. So uh, for yeast, uh, we, uh, we never really demonstrated reversibility. What we saw is we could make cells live longer so we could slow this process of aging. Okay. But we couldn't take an old cell and make it young again. Okay. In uh, mammals, I think people would have said uh, the same thing until, you know, about 10, 15 years ago, when uh, it was shown by um, Yamanaka that you could take uh, a, a fully differentiated cell of a human, and it could be a young person, it could be an old person, doesn't matter. And you could reprogram that cell to go back into uh, a, a, a state of, uh, that's found in early embryos during embryonic development, okay? And uh, the, that state is kind of a stem cell-like state. In fact, they're called embryonic stem cells that occur very, very early in embryonic development. And what he did is he showed that by adding a particular cocktail of genes that were expressed into proteins into this old differentiated cell, he could convert it back to a cell, uh, a cell like embryonic stem cells. And they're called IPS cells for induced pluripotent stem cells. So that's reverse, reversing aging at the cellular level, okay? And the other thing we know that must be the case is uh, as a species, and we knew this forever, uh, we have to be able to reverse the aging process because any uh, species that could not do that would die out very quickly. And we continue to propagate as a species. So something about going you know, the, uh, uh, through the process of generating germ cells and having the germ cells uh, make a, a, a zygote which develops into a, an embryo. Something about that process as a whole has reversed aging. Interesting. And is there, yeah, so essentially every time you create a new zygote, you're obviously creating a new organism that's young. That's and young, it's exactly. All the, way, all the way down to the cells, uh, they look uh, and act young. Are there any... Um, you know, there's a few different places I want to go, but, you know, that reminds me of questions related to the 
you know, I, I think everyone understands we inherit our genomes, the, the sequence of the genetic code from mom and dad. Can we also inherit, uh, excuse me, uh, inherit any of these epigenetic modifications? And is there anything, so even though, you know, when you create the new zygote, you're, you're sort of restarting a, a brand new organism in the young state, are there nonetheless um, ways to inherit like if your mother and or father are older and they have perhaps accumulated mutations or epigenetic modifications in the sperm or the egg, can that type of thing lead to heritable consequences for the offspring? Okay. So certainly genetic changes will always be heritable, will always be inherited. And um, so that, you know, as, as a rule, if uh, you have, uh, a progeny from older parents, uh, those uh, progeny are more susceptible to genetic, to inheriting genetic changes. So from dad, you know, uh, sperm, spermatocytes, the precursors of sperm replicate continuously. And so an older person has had sperm cells that have undergone more DNA replications and have had more chance for mutations to occur. And so there's a higher probability of uh, mutations being inherited in the progeny. Uh, for mom, uh, the oocytes uh, don't uh, divide during uh, growth and development and adulthood, um, but they're sitting around. So things can happen and damage can occur. And we know that... Uh, birth defects, many due to chromosomal uh, abnormalities, uh, go up with the age of the mother and the newborns. So um, uh, those changes happen, but epigenetic changes, um, I think there's not, it, it would first of all be pretty hard to show that uh, experimentally, uh, as opposed to a, a DNA change where you just read off the sequence of the DNA. Um, and I think the, the evidence is, uh, you know, at best preliminary as to whether epigenetic changes could be inherited. The other problem is, you know, epigenetic changes are pretty much the slate is wiped clean during um, uh, formation of the germ cells. I mean, that's, that's kind of thought to be the mechanism uh, by which you can get back to youth again is, is to do that. Um, so that would say you would not expect epigenetic changes to be inherited generally. But I think the, the uh, jury is still out on that question. When we think about some of the, the key players here that you mentioned, the, the sirtuins and NAD and things, what is the, the natural course that those molecules take throughout the lifespan of the average organism? Are they decreasing or changing in some way over the lifespan? And, and if so, what, what actually drives that? Yeah, it's a very important question. Um, and so for the sirtuins, let me give a little bit more background. Uh, humans have seven of these proteins and they're encoded by seven different genes. They're all related to one another, but they're not identical, they're different. Um, they all have the same enzymatic activity that I mentioned earlier. They require NAD and they deacetylate uh, histones and other proteins in cells. Now, th the seven are different in a few different ways. Uh, the main difference is they're spread across different parts of the cell. So three of them are in the nucleus of the cell. So in the nucleus of the cell, they can deacetylate. They have substrates, if you will, or targets that include the histones, as I mentioned, which are uh, on the DNA and in the nucleus of the cell. But it also includes uh, proteins that regulate transcription, so-called transcription factors that turn genes on and off um, in a gene-specific way. And those are in the nucleus. And those can be deacetylated by the nuclear sirtuins. Okay, and three sirtuins of the seven human proteins are in the nucleus, sirt1, six, and seven. Okay, three others are in a specific organelle 
in cells called mitochondria. And that's, it's a very provocative thing, actually, because mitochondria uh, make energy for the cells. And energy in cells uh, comes in a chemical called ATP. And uh, the ATP is produced by mitochondria. So the fact that three of the seven uh, sirtuins are in this one tiny space in the cell, I think, uh, is at least uh, suggesting that mitochondria and uh, energy production production might be especially important in the aging process in mammals. Okay. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I was just talking with someone about mitochondria actually. And we got into some aging stuff. Um, so uh, as far as the question of why sirtuins would be in mit mitochondria, is it because the mitochondria have their own little mini genomes? Are they doing the same kind of uh, uh, DNA modifications that they are in the nuclear genome? I don't think so. I don't, I mean, I, I think that certainly the mitochondria do have their own uh, tiny genomes. Um, but what, from what we know about the sirtuins that are there, and I think the, the most uh, prominent one is called SIRT3 in the mitochondria, is that it's, it's deacetylating uh, enzymes in the mitochondria, proteins in the mitochondria that uh, uh, have uh, eth that either are involved in metabolic processes in the mitochondria, and the main one that seems to be a target of SIRT3 is uh, the degradation of fatty acids, so the oxidation of, of fatty acids in the mitochondria, where the enzymes that catalyze oxidation of fatty acids uh, are substrates for SIRT3 to deacetylate them, and that turns them on, that makes them more active. So SIRT3 would upregulate uh, fat destruction in the mitochondria, and that produces energy, of course, when you degrade fat. That's one way you produce ATP. Uh, another thing that SIRT3 de deacetylates in the mitochondria is uh, an enzyme that removes, uh, that fixes oxidative damage to proteins in the mitochondria. Okay, that's called, it's called, the enzyme is called superoxide dismutase or SOD. And uh, SOD is uh, deacetylated by SIRT3 inside the mitochondria and that increases the activity of SOD. So that would give it a, a, a mitochondria greater capacity to repair any damage that uh, is accumulating, which may also slow down uh, uh, the uh, decay of mitochondria and the aging of mitochondria. So in the mitochondria, I think there are two things at least going on. Uh, one is they're involved in... Um, uh, metabolic reactions, such as the degradation of fat. Uh, and secondly, they themselves get older and more damaged as we get older. And both of those uh, processes tend to be counteracted or regulated by SIRT3. One is to upregulate the uh, degradation of fat, and the other is to increase the repair capacity of the mitochondria. So you might imagine then uh, that with this NAD-dependent uh, 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 set of proteins, the sirtuins, you can maintain a healthy mitochondria for longer if you keep those proteins as active as possible. And you might also uh, have a beneficial effect of degrading ex excess fat to exchange uh, fat for ATP. I see. So if these sirtuins are NAD-dependent, um, I think an interesting question is to what extent does do NAD levels change throughout the lifespan or, or even throughout, like say the day, um, sleep, wake cycles, um, diet, things like that. Yeah. That was your original question. Uh, all I, that I just said was background to answering your question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what NAD changes are extremely important in, in the picture here. And the most important thing about NAD levels is that they seem to go down as we get older. We, 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 we uh, uh, lose about half of our NAD during aging. And that's gonna have uh, uh, really disastrous consequences to the activity of these sirtuins and any other process in cells uh, that requires NAD. So um, 
you know, maintaining NAD levels would be, a, a, I think, a, a very important um, way to stave off some of the effects of aging. And there's a lot of data uh, to back that up in uh, the laboratory. Um, so uh, rodents, for example, um, can be made to live longer if you uh, boost their NAD levels. Okay. So that's a really important finding. Um, and uh, at least part of that effect re uh, is due to uh, sirtuins, because if you deactivate SIRT1, one of the sirtuins, uh, this effect is ameliorated. It's, I'm sorry, it's abolished. So um, I think that uh, NAD decline is probably a, a, a very important aspect uh, of human aging. And, um, you know, this was really the, the one of the uh, very early uh, underpinnings uh, of Elysium when uh, the CEO, Eric Marcatulli, and I uh, first started uh, talking about 10 years ago about ways that a company could uh, start to utilize some of the new findings that were coming in regarding the aging process. And so um, going to those, those mouse experiments where you were, where people were able to extend uh, the lifespan of rodents, uh, two questions there are a, how did you actually increase NAD levels in the animals? Was it through dietary supplementation or engineering a specific kind of mouse and B how, what is the magnitude of, of life extension that, that was able to be achieved? Yeah. So um, the, the simplest thing would be to just uh, feed uh, NAD to the mice. Okay. The problem with that is NAD itself uh, is a compound that does not enter cells. It can't get into cells. So it can't raise NAD in cells if it can't get inside. So uh, what was done is to use uh, molecules so, so the way cells make NAD is through a series of uh, enzymatic reactions in cells where you start with a small building block, which is uh, nicotinamide or nicotinic acid, and uh, enzymes make it bigger and bigger stepwise until you end up with NAD. And so what's done is you take one of the intermediates in the middle of that pathway, okay? And there were two uh, 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 intermediates right in the middle of the pathway, one is called NMN and the other is called NR, okay? And the NMN stands for nicotinamide mononucleotide, the NR for nicotinamide riboside. And if you uh, add those compounds, they are taken up by cells. So what you can do is you can feed uh, 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 compounds into the middle of this pathway, which will then, uh, uh, interact with the enzymes that carry out those terminal steps in making NAD, and that will raise NAD levels in cells. So that's what was done. It was to uh, give these uh, compounds, either NR or NMN, to uh, mice in the drinking water or in the food, okay, and then measure to see that NAD levels were raised, and they are and then uh, to see what happens. And what happens is uh, they live longer. Now, you ask uh, how much longer. So it turns out in mice, um, it's, you can, various genetic interventions can make them live longer, but only by about 10 or 20%. That's really the best anybody has done in mice. Another thing that will do that is by restricting uh, the food in a process that's called calorie restriction. That's been known for about a century now. And again, they'll live longer by up to maybe 30% or so by that intervention. Okay. And the effect of the NAD supplementation, you know, is of the uh, 10 or 20% uh, nature and extension of lifespan. And, and, uh, you know, doing, doing lifespan studies in humans, I imagine is, is difficult or at the very least expensive uh, and requires a lot of patience. But is there anything that's been done in humans, um, any studies that might suggest that uh, something similar could be true? Well, I don't think so. Not yet. 
Um, and the problem is exactly what you say that, you know, who's going to wait uh, to do a human study. Um, so what you uh, can do is you can try to find some kind of surrogate for uh, how long someone lives. And that's what people have been looking for for a long, long time. They've, they're called biomarkers of aging. And if you had a biomarker of aging, then you could simply look at that biomarker and that would tell you the biological age of the organism. And you could look, measure that and see if you slow down its progression and not have to wait uh, the entire lifespan to see uh, the, whether there's been any effect. So that's been uh, one of the holy grails in the aging field is to find a biomarker for aging for a long time. And um, are there any good biomarkers in humans? What's happened, I think, uh, this is my opinion, is in, in the past decade or so, um, there's been uh, a, a very important uh, biomarker that's that's been found and it's again it has to do with uh, a modification of an important molecule in cells in this case it's the dna and uh it's dna methylation so uh dna tends to be methylated at some uh positions where you have a c and a g nucleotide residue together so c phosphate g cpg Okay, and you get methylation uh, on the C residue. And that happens at various sites across the genome, maybe, I don't know, maybe a million total sites across the entire genome. And what's uh, become available is the ability to uh, uh, very accurately assess the methylation status of all of these residues, which is a combination of uh, chemicals that can distinguish between the methylated C and the unmethylated C and cut the DNA at the one and not the other and DNA sequencing. So you can uh, uh, tell where this has occurred. And uh, in, in so doing, you can assess simultaneously the methylation of many, many uh, uh, residues across the genome all at once in one experiment. So that was what was done initially um, by Steve Horvath and his colleagues was to just uh, look at uh, the methylation uh, of DNA, okay, in uh, various uh, cohorts of uh, people that were involved in uh, human studies of different kinds, okay, with, so that there were biological samples available. So let's say blood uh, of these people. And um, what they did was to uh, uh, assess uh, methylation status across many of these sites in the genome. Okay. And they asked whether they could see a pattern of methylation that changed in a very characteristic way with the age of the person providing the sample, okay? And um, they used, uh, uh, and what they did is you just uh, uh, train the computer to the task of finding these methyl sites that changed characteristically or monotonically with aging uh, of, of the person in question. So let's say the older the individual, the more methylated that C was. Okay, so it goes from in a young person being unmethylated, in a middle-aged person, partially methylated, and in an old person, fully methylated, let's say. And the technology is such that uh, you can actually make those determinations, okay? But you need the computer and machine learning to then go into that data set and actually find the relevant methods that you could survey in this way and come up with a score that would tell you the age of the person. So that's what they did. And in the uh, initial studies so about a decade ago, there were some three to 400 uh, methyls. 
specific sites now in the genome and and assessing those methods gave you a readout of the age of the person. Okay. So that's not what people were, people were thinking about something much simpler when they were thinking about biomarkers of aging. Right. Um, but none of those simple things really worked. So here's something that looked like it worked and, you know, you could program uh, uh, the algorithm to do this task. Okay. So that, I think that's um, now been elaborated on quite a bit in, in the last decade. And people have really, um, I think, taken advantage or start, are starting to take advantage of this uh, uh, technology of DNA methylation assessment. Um, and, uh, you know, at Elysium, we got very interested in this uh, some, some number of years ago. Uh, to see if uh, 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 we could make this work in humans and, and, and rather than require blood, we could do it, it with saliva. And uh, that's actually a, a works and it's uh, a product that, that Elysium offers called uh, Index. Mm. So there's a way for scientists to take a biological sample for people and look at the DNA, but they're not looking at the sequence of DNA. They're looking at... Uh, the pattern of these epigenetic modifications on the DNA. And that tends to tell you something about the biological age of the person. And my understanding is, uh, you know, part of the point of this is the biological age as, as you, as you see it in these methylation patterns is not necessarily going to be equal to the chronological age. That's so right. And, we'll broad, and broadly it will, right? So you'll see if, if you look as a function of age, you will definitely see, uh, a relationship between uh, chronological age and this biological age. They'll be similar, okay? But they won't be exactly the same. And they'll be, imagine a straight line mm -hmm. going uh, age versus methylation status, okay? And each person will be uh, a little bit off that line. Some will be right on it. They'll be average. But uh, those that are off it are interesting because that means that their biological age is different, uh, you know, may not be extremely different, but is somewhat different from the chronological age. And so a test like this, you know, you can uh, impute a rate of aging for that person. So a person that's right on that line, okay, would be aging exactly uh, uh, average, okay, in the population. And you could call their rate of aging uh, as one, okay? someone whose methylation status showed a biological age younger than their chronological age, you know, might be aging at a rate of say 0 0.9. And of course that's <laughs> desirable. Um, how, I mean, if you took, you know, you took a random sample of a bunch of people, how many, how many, uh, what percentage of people will tend to be, um, very high, high off of that line, whatever, what, you know, however we define that. I think if you took a random sample, this is what they did in the original experiments, right? Um, the way the line is drawn, right? The line will be average. So there'd be the same number of people above and below the line by, by the nature of the beast. Okay. Now we've noticed in customers uh, of Elysium that there's a slight skewing uh, so that there are more people than it would be expected that are aging more slowly mm. than you than you would expect in a sample that size. Okay, and you know the way we interpret that is maybe you know we our customers are kind of self selected as people who are very health conscious, mm -hmm. right? And uh, uh, in aggregate uh, would would show a slower average rate of aging compared to the general population. And um, can, can you talk about how this product works a little bit more? So, so if someone purchases it, like what is it physically that they're doing? And then what does the output actually look like that they see in the end? Yeah, the, so the product would be, it would be not terribly different from uh, other products out there like 23andMe uh, or Ancestry.com where uh, you, know, you get the product, you, you uh, uh, create a sputum sample, and you mail it off 
to our labs and uh, the sample gets analyzed and uh, the data gets sent back to the customer. It's, it's extremely simple with, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, information to put things into context for the customer. And um, uh, so I think it's really, it's, it's a cool product. I think it's really cool though, that it, it now potentiates, it allows you to do other things. So for example, our first product, which was based on uh, the research I talked about earlier with sirtuins and NAD, is called Basis, okay? And it has the, uh, two ingredients in it. One is an NAD booster, this thing NR. It's one of the ingredients. And the second ingredient is um, uh, based on research that shows that there are compounds that specifically activate uh, one of these uh, human sirtuins called SIRT1, which is a, a quite important one, actually. It's a nuclear sirtuin. And the original uh, studies showed that one of these activators of SIRT1 was uh, a molecule maybe some of your listeners uh, would have heard of called resveratrol. Uh, the, the red wine molecule. The red wine molecule, yeah. And there's a lot of studies have been done on resveratrol uh, since uh, David Sinclair originally showed it could activate SIRT1. And um, in rodents, uh, resveratrol has a, a, a really good effects on the health of the animal. It really is a, 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 a amazing uh, molecule. And the thinking 15 years ago was that this was going to be wonderful for humans. And a lot of people, including myself, uh, were taking it at that time. Um, but it turns out it, in humans, it, it's so-called bioavailability is not so good. So it's very hard to get an adequate dose of resveratrol in humans. And um, so we knew all that uh, 10 years ago. So we uh, opted for uh, a, a, more, a more obscure uh, compound that comes from blueberries, not grapes, which is a structural analog of resveratrol. Okay, so it's similar as a molecule, but with some uh, differences. And uh, we had noted uh, in the literature that uh, even in animals uh, in the laboratory, it seemed to work at a lower dose than resveratrol, which says it's more potent. And so uh, we think that this is a, a version of uh, resveratrol that is more bioavailable and um, much more likely to have beneficial effects in people. And it's called terastilbe with a PT at the beginning. And so uh, that's the second ingredient in basis, this combination of uh, NAD boosting, which should uh, 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 raise the activity of all seven sirtuins, along with terastilbene, which should, uh, by a different mechanism, activate SIRT1. We thought that was probably from what we knew at the time and would still be true, uh, will give you the best shot of uh, maximizing the activity of these sirtuins, especially against uh, uh, forces of nature that are causing NAD levels to decline and deactivate them as we get older. Okay, so that's the product, and that's the rationale behind the product, that uh, it contains two kind of synergistic compounds that give you the best shot of activating sirtuins and impacting aging favorably. Okay, mm -hmm. so now uh, you wanna, uh, what, what we're interested in doing, and I'll just give you a little teaser about this, is mm -hmm. to uh, ask, is, can we use these two products of index DNA methylation product and basis, the NAD uh, sirtuin product, uh, can they play off one another? Okay. And so uh, one thing we've done is we've looked at, um, we, we uh, had uh, uh, samples of people from uh, one of the studies uh, that we've done, actually, where uh, we could take those samples and do both the index test on the people and also measure NAD levels in these people, 
Okay, so these people have not taken basis. They're just, it's just people out there in the population. And we found that there was this uh, relationship in that the higher, so we all have different NAD levels. They're not going to be identical, right? It's determined by who we are. Um, and the higher the NAD levels, what we found, the pattern was the higher the NAD levels in the, these people, the lower their biological age as determined by index, which is really good, I think. And so um, it, it uh, I think, establishes credence for the idea that there really is a relationship between NAD and aging in humans, okay? So the, the next step, uh, which is a study we uh, uh, have started to do, is to ask, um, okay, so what happens to somebody if we measure their biological age and they start taking bases? What happens to it? I mean, so this, this gets back to something you asked much earlier uh, about reversing aging. Okay, can you reverse it? Uh, and, you know, that's a study that's going to take time because now it's, that's the so-called longitudinal study where you're following the same people over a, a, a prolonged period of time. So uh, we don't know the answer to this yet. And... Um, my suspicion is, you know, we started this a few, several years ago, like three years ago. And, um, you know, we started looking at uh, the data and uh, my thinking is uh, we got a confound that occurred in the, in the time frame of that study. And for this, we, you know, we just simply ask our customers if they're interested in opting in to something like this, where we simply, you know, at baseline when they, before they start new customers before they start taking basis. Uh, they do an index test. Um, and in a year after taking it, they do another index test. Okay, it's that simple. Uh, but what intervened in that uh, year was COVID and isolation protocol uh, and change in lifestyle and habits. Um, and we suspect that that was a major confound that uh, it will probably be shown that uh, COVID uh, changed uh, the rate of aging in people. I really expect that to be found. Uh, so we, we very much are interested in getting good data on this question, but we don't have it yet. Interesting. Given everything you know, everything that we know about aging so far, do you think it's possible in principle that one day we could basically put an end to aging to be effectively immortal such that uh, uh, the normal aging process doesn't happen and, and the only way people would die would be if there was some other kind of disease or accident or something like that? I do. Oh, wow. I, I do. And, uh, you know, I would have said no up until as recently as five years ago. And I did say no anytime I was asked that question. Um, but, um, I, I, I've reevaluated, uh, and th I think that, uh, at some point, uh, you know, if, if, uh, civilization continues to advance in the way that it has been and nothing catastrophic happens to the world, uh, that, um, it will be possible. Part of the reason for saying that is that, you know, you can achieve these little, uh, bits of success. Uh, with things like NAD intervention, okay? And, you know, many uh, important discoveries start with something that sort of barely works, and then you make it better and better and better, okay? And the other thing is, relates back to another topic we discussed, and that is that it seems you can reverse aging at the level, at the level of individual cells by converting... Uh, skin cells, let's say, of uh, an adult animal back into embryonic stem cells, okay? And if you can do that, uh, make that uh, a complete reversal, right? Why not, why shouldn't you be, it be possible to make a little bit of a reversal, at least enough to stop aging in its tracks, okay? And there's been some uh, papers published uh, in mice that would lead you to believe that this might be possible. 
in humans. And um, it's a little bit, uh, it, you can do things in mice that you can't easily do in humans, of course. So this, this process of uh, turning cells back into stem cells that was developed by Yamanaka involves uh, 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 putting into those cells uh, four different genes. And those four genes, when they're expressed, uh, will uh, 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 turn the cells into uh, embryonic stem cells. Okay. And so in mice, of course, you can make transgenic mice where you've added genes into the genomes of the animals. And so what was done is to put those four genes in, into mice, in a way that you could turn them all on at the same time in all the cells of the mouse, okay? And initially when they did that, in the first set of experiments, what do you think happened? Tell us. <laughs> they got cancer. I see. And the reason they got cancer is these embryonic stem cells. Remember, this is the early embryo, which has to grow a lot. And these embryonic stem cells are very rapidly growing cells. I see. And if you culture embryonic stem cells, they grow like gangbusters. Okay. It's like you're, you're growing a bacterial cell that grows so fast. Um, <laughs> and so to just do this in an unregulated way, won't, won't, won't do the in fact, It'll do the opposite of what you want to have happen. So what they then did was to figure out a way to control their expression, these four genes, so that you can give the animal short pulses of intermittent expression. So you give them a pulse, wait a few weeks, another pulse, wait a few weeks. And when they did that, they uh, reported uh, elements of reversal of aging in the animals, which is uh, a very striking finding. So, you know, there's just been a few papers at this point in time on this. So I think we want to uh, wait and see and assess this uh, more completely, but it at least raises this, this possibility that this is a strategy that could work. Now in humans, of course, you can simply, you know, uh, start uh, mucking around uh, with the genome in this way. So you'd have to find some other way to skin the cat. Uh, but, you know, those are technical problems and not problems uh, in principle. Well, an another thing that this makes me think of is, <clears throat> you know, questions related to the brain, which, which I wanted to talk about. So, you know, even if you could reverse aging through, through some of the means that, that you've been describing for us, you know, if you were to... Uh, you know, your neurons are, are really weird in certain ways that, that we touched on a little bit earlier. They don't divide. Um, and yet our brains do age. And not only do you want to, you know, pres preserve longevity and have uh, youthfulness uh, in terms of the functioning of your mind, but you also couldn't, you know, even, even if you wouldn't want to, even if you could, uh, to sort of revert all of your neurons back to uh, a stem cell state to rejuvenate them because you would lose all the information that, that makes you you and that, and that is your life. So how do you start to think about um, aging in the brain and how, you know, is there anything known about how to preserve the function of neurons or prevent it from decaying as quickly as, as they normally do? Yeah, it's, a, it's a difficult challenge. Um, so the first question is what actually happens in the aging process of the brain. Um, and years ago, it was thought that we simply lost neurons, that uh, neurons start dying, and the number of brain cells goes down, and uh, that's, that's how the brain ages. And consistent with that, uh, people found that uh, the volume of the brain shrinks with aging. And so uh, that fit this neat idea that you, you just lose brain cells. And since they're, they're non-dividing, once you lose a cell, you cannot replace it. Okay. Um, now, uh, however, uh, that's probably not exactly correct. Okay. And probably more important than the loss 
of neur- so neurons are lost, but in particular in neurodegenerative diseases. And the loss of neurons really it does, it, it, it it tends to uh, there's a lot of overlap here uh, between uh, normal aging in the brain and disease induced aging. But um, in Alzheimer's, there, there there's neuron neuronal loss. But in normal aging, there probably isn't, and it's probably more a matter of just shrinkage at every level in the brain, at the cellular level, uh, at uh, some ultrastructural level, but not at the level of the neurons actually die and disappear. So, you, and you have to preserve more than just the neurons in the brain. You have to preserve the connectivity of the neurons, which are uh, connected at synapses that are due to processes that extend uh, from the neuron, uh, which is where really the information lies in the brain. Um, And so it's a very difficult problem to think about. Um, We can uh, begin to address some of this. So again, you know, we've been interested, uh, you know, I'm interested in the brain myself, and Elysium has been interested in this for a while. Um, and so one uh, study uh, that I think is a very good study out of Oxford University uh, studied uh, aging uh, in, in the human brain in subjects, uh, and, and it was monitoring aging by brain volume, which was determined by uh, imaging. And so the study really is... Uh, leverages uh, advances in brain imaging technologies, which has is, is, is gotten quite good and quite uh, quantitative. And so it was a two-year study, and they could uh, clearly demonstrate significant shrinkage in the brains in this poised population that they were looking at. And the poised population was, I believe, people in their 70s uh, who had mild cognitive impairment, so MCI. So they were, uh, you know, at, at a, a point where they were losing brain function, perhaps a little bit faster than ordinary people, which made the study doable. And so they could see shrinkage in the brain. Now, there was some information out there um, that um, uh, there was a bad actor that's produced that's causing at least some of this shrinkage, which is called homocysteine. Okay, and what what you could see is that there's a relationship between levels of homocysteine in people and uh, brain shrinkage. And so it was thought that if you could uh, reduce homocysteine levels in people, you could also uh, mitigate the brain shrinkage. And it turns out that they showed that uh, the right combination of three B vitamins, of all things, at the right doses, which tends to be much higher than the doses you would take in a vitamin pill, uh, could uh, uh, reduce shrinkage in people, brain shrinkage over this two-year period. And the reason, part of the reason is that, I, I, I don't remember the exact details of this, but one of the B, B vitamins, I believe it's B6, uh, B9, and B12, uh, one of them promotes the degradation of hom- homocysteine And the other two uh, retard uh, the synthesis of homocysteine. So both uh, have an effect together of lowering homocysteine levels in these people. And so that's that's an interesting finding. And, uh, you know, we got involved uh, with uh, uh, David Smith, who conducted this study a while ago um, and uh, based another product uh, at Elysium called Matter on uh, 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 you know, the exact uh, formula of what they were providing these people. Now, the only, thing they sh- the only uh, limitation of the study in the people is it showed that people who also had unusually low levels of omega-3 fatty acids didn't respond well to the B vitamins. They didn't have, they didn't have an effect. And so it's thought that you know, in order to get the benefit of this, uh, you need sufficient levels of uh, omega threes. So we put an omega threes into the product. So everybody taking 
the B vitamins will also be getting a dose of omega-3. So that's, you know, I think that that's an interesting product because it's based on, on human studies and um, can impact the brain in a way that we uh, think is meaningful. That is to say, uh, the volume of the brain. So, so what, so what, what are all, remind us, what were all the ingredients in that product? So, so it has the three B vitamins, B6, uh, B9, which is folic acid, and B12 at the appropriate doses. And what are those doses compared to like a- They're higher. Or, they're much higher. I don't, I higher. don't remember the details, but they're much higher. I see. Um, and for those people who might not benefit by virtue of having uh, low omega-3 fatty acids, which is in itself not a good thing, omega-3s are healthful, uh, there's an omega-3 uh, supplement in there. I see. So, so that one, that's called matter. That's like the brain product. You've got one called basis, which is uh, basically the NAD product um, that we mentioned earlier. And you've got a couple other ones. What, what are those and, and what's, what's the thinking behind the ingredient list there? Yeah. One of the newer ones is called signal. Okay. And that's related to uh, basis. Okay. So the NAD booster in basis is something called uh, NR, nicotinamide riboside. And that's essentially a half of an NAD molecule. So you have the nicotinamide nucleotide and a ribose. That's NR. And a man uh, is one step further down the chain. And it, it's the nicotinamide and the ribose with a phosphate on it. So it's one step closer to NAD. Some people think, some people favor nicotinamide over nicotinamide riboside, although in animal studies, they both seem to work equivalently. Okay. But there's, you know, there was a paper published um, on uh, NMN uh, fairly recently showing that uh, it had the ability in humans of making insulin work more efficiently. That is to say, increasing insulin sensitivity, which is thought to be a good thing uh, for health. So we wanted to have a product uh, that had NMN in it. And then we found, um, uh, so one, one of the other interesting targets that you know, I've been interested in for a long time. Uh, so terastilbene targets sir t one as I said earlier, as does resveratrol. But there's this important sir 2 in mitochondria, sir t 3 that we think uh, will be important in maintaining mitochondrial integrity and health with aging, if we could keep it active, okay? So the NAD booster will help with that, but if we had a, a more specific molecule that could target it, uh, that would help even more. And so the literature informed us of something, a molecule called Hinocchio, uh, which is uh, reported in several different labs to activate SIRT3. And so again, that's something we, we, we got very interested in and um, obtained a very good source of it. And that's the second ingredient in, in Signal. So we think Signal <laughs> will have an effect um, that will be more targeted on mitochondria in aging and energy production, things of that sort, perhaps fat uh, uh, degradation in mitochondria. So that's again on the metabolic side with basis. So you mentioned earlier, um, I think an important thing to talk about is bioavailability. You mentioned, for example, resveratrol is a very interesting molecule that does really cool stuff, but it's not particularly bioavailable. And that was why you guys were using this other thing called terastilbene, which is more potent. Are the ingredients in all of your products reasonably bioavailable or do you add add something to it to, to boost the bioavailability? Because I know that a lot of, my understanding is a lot of supplements out there, um, not in every case, but in some cases, you know, it might say it's got 500% your daily value of whatever, but you end up absorbing very little of it. So, so how do you think about bioavailability? Yeah, we're interested in bioavailability uh, in all cases. And, you know, so I think that in the products we've discussed, uh, the compounds are relatively bioavailable. Uh, where they're, they're not, then we're really interested in um, technology which exists in which the compound is essentially encapsulated 
in uh, vesicles to make it more bioavailable. And I think, you know, the uh, vesicle technology, again, is one of the things that I think has really taken off. In fact, the RNA vaccines that deliver RNA to cells work because the RNA is first encapsulated in vesicles and the actual vaccine is the vesicles that will be stable, okay, in the blood and will then be able to fuse with other uh, mem the membranes of cells to deliver their contents to the cells. And so uh, we're applicable, uh, and, and you know, a lot, number of the products we're thinking of uh, uh, that are under, in development, uh, we're thinking of starting to use this technology to increase bioavailability. So yes, I do think it's an important issue in any of these products. And I think it's one that uh, will become uh, increasingly utilized uh, by us uh, down the line. And um, well, I am just curious too. Um, so you, you co-founded this company called Elysium, which is making these products. Um, you know, on the one hand, I can imagine one thing that prompted you to do this was just your research and the relevance of, of what you were learning about aging to making these kinds of products, but what made you want to start a company as a scientist? I think most scientists I've met uh, aren't inclined to do that. Well, uh, first of all, I think it's uh, MIT is uh, uh, supportive of their faculty also being entrepreneurs, okay? So that there's a supportive environment that we have. Um, and uh, a lot of my colleagues at MIT uh, start companies. And in fact, I, I've been involved in companies in the past. Most recently, uh, before Elysium, I was involved in a Sirtuins company uh, called Sirtris with David Sinclair and uh, Christoph Westfall. I was co-chair of their SAB. Uh, so, uh, and, and since the start of Elysium, uh, I've started, been a founder in another company that's a kind of a, a drug development company to target SIRT-T6, um, another uh, important uh, SIRT-2 in, in the nucleus, but is really highly focused on uh, uh, clinical drugs and developing drugs on SIRT-T6. So I think that, um, I, you know, it's basically for aging, you know, there was all this work that had been carried out over a long, a long period of time that was just beginning to uh, uh, make a blueprint for how you could take this and develop it into something that could benefit health, okay? And so it's, you know, a very uh, uh, attractive prospect to try to do that and to see, you know, can we, can we first of all, find out, does, will this work the same way in people? And secondly, have the satisfaction of actually being able to impact human health uh, with such a company. The other thing I liked about the concept was uh, really Eric Marcatulli's idea that, you know, on the one hand, at the time we initiated our conversations about 10 years ago, you know, there were these supplement companies of which there were many. Uh, and uh, the quality was, was really frankly, not, not great. And some of them didn't even have in the product what they claim was in there. Uh, and if they, it, it was in there. It was almost certainly something that didn't do anything. And so we wanted to make sure that we had uh, uh, products of high quality and thought that if they really worked, if we could assure and do the testing in humans to back up the preclinical data that they really worked, that it would actually start to form a space between the supplement companies on the low end and the drug companies here, the classical drug companies, that there was a space in the middle that was uh, an opportunity space to have compounds that really work, but that could be delivered uh, to customers quickly because they were natural. And so they didn't have to go through the kind of FDA testing and approval of a, a novel compound, a drug. Uh, and that was an exciting possibility to have this platform, be a platform company that was not a supplement company that would be able to uh, 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 essentially have a rapid timetable for development and testing and uh, delivery of products direct to consumer online um, in an efficient way. 
So, you know, there's kind of a lot of uh, attractive features about the company uh, for me. It's novelty. It's prospect for uh, saying that, yeah, this aging uh, research uh, really led to something and targeting aging is really a good thing for health. What are, I mean, I know the aging field is really booming right now. What do you think are, you know, what are one or two like big outstanding questions in aging right now that you think will likely know the answer to in the next few years? Well, I think something that's, that's really, there's a lot of studies now on um, uh, senescent cells, this, this area called cell senescence. And cell senescence is uh, when cells uh, stop uh, uh, functioning, doing their normal function, but they, they don't die. So they hang around. And uh, that's thought to be a bad thing. And it's thought that if you could take those cells and kill them, eliminate them, it's much better than having them hanging around. And so there are companies uh, out there, a lot of them, that's why I think we're going to know about this quickly, um, that are developing compounds that can selectively kill a senescent cell. Typically, these senescent cells, so I mentioned earlier that uh, when uh, dividing cells divide and their telomeres get sufficiently short, right? They get a signal that a damage signal. Okay. And they stop dividing. They can also get that damage signal, not just by telomere shortening, but if the DNA actually does get damaged as the cells get old and they stop dividing, but they don't die. They just sit there. Um, and so these companies are developing these senolytic compounds. So it's compounds that can lyse senescent cells and uh, there are, uh, you know, a lot of uh, tremendous amount of activity in that field now, which is why I think uh, in the next few years, in a very short time frame, uh, we'll we'll know the full potential of this area of aging research that you can uh, impact aging favorably by targeting not an old organism but old cells mm. in the organism. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Leonard, um, are there any final thoughts you want to leave people with or, or anything you want to emphasize from our conversation? Well, you know, I think um, I, I would like to leave people with the idea that we've learned a lot about aging in the past uh, three decades. And um, typically in research, uh, the benefits of the research uh, lag from the time of the research itself. And this is, we're seeing this in cancer where uh, incredible information emerged about human cancers from the 1970s uh, through the, you know, the 2000s, uh, but very little in the way of treatment with the exception of uh, childhood cancers. Um, and in some cases, diagnostics for cancer, but medicines uh, lacked for cancers. But I think that that's starting to change now um, because uh, a lot of work's been done uh, to take advantage of the basic science. And the same is going to be true in aging research, okay? But it's staged, you know, about 30 years later than cancer research. So I think um, people uh, should uh, take heart that there has been progress and that there will be uh, uh, remedies, not to, to uh, eliminate aging, uh, but to uh, impact it in a way that we can stay healthy longer and keep doing what we like doing uh, for a longer period of time. So I think that's one take home I would like people to have. Uh, another is that, um, you know, I think that there's kind of a seamless uh, continuum of, um, uh, the academic research environment and um, the world of companies where, um, you know, you want to go, if you, if you can be on a path that starts with a simple experiment in the laboratory and follow that all the way uh, to human studies, uh, it's, it's a very satisfying thing. This is a personal 
uh, uh, statement. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been great to be a part of that uh, all along the way. Well, Dr. Leonard Garante, thank you for your time and, and everything that you shared with us. Thank you. Thank you.